Hey there, cloud enthusiasts and tech innovators. Welcome back to our channel. This is Michael Forrester with CoCloud, where the future is in the cloud and in DevOps and AWS is the silver lining. Before we launch into the greatest and latest from the world of Amazon Web Services, do me a solid and smash that like button and let's energize the cloud community together. So today we're gonna to take a thrilling plunge into the world of seamless deployments with a deep dive into blue-green deployments with CDK pipelines. Imagine deploying with zero downtime. That's what we're talking about. Next, we're gonna talk about the scoop on generative AI around Amazon Bedrock. It's not just a buzzword, folks. It's the real deal and it's available now. So get ready to unleash your creativity with the flexible power of AI on AWS. Security buffs, listen up. AWS is up in the ante in 2024. Multi-factor authentication is becoming a, an enabled must for organizational users who are using AWS organizations, particularly for the root user. So we're talking about adding some ironclad perspective security to your cloud fortress. For those of you who are green at heart, we're also gonna talk just a little bit about how to scale to zero, meaning no resources, with Kubernetes and Carpenter. So you can save your pennies, save the planet, save your business, it's a win. Are you uh, curious perhaps about how, how AWS shields you from the dark forces of the web? We're gonna talk uh, a little bit about what goes on behind the curtains of AWS with your, against the distributed denial of service attacks. So we're gonna give you information and resources to understand how that functions. It's cybersecurity at its best. I could argue that AWS is first and foremost a security company. Moving on, we're gonna talk a little bit about the cloud native architecture series of which we're gonna talk about number seven, which is called containers. And I recommend reading the whole series, but we're gonna to just touch it just briefly to give you access to it. And for you systems tools masters out there, for you fleet managers out there, systems manager is now a breeze to enable by default in your AWS organization, forcing all of your EC2 instances to have it installed by default. So it's a very uh, streamlined feature for your EC2 instances that has not been available before. And finally, it is totally worth mentioning that we're, AWS has added the well-architected framework and DevOps guidance, which is a series of stories and sagas, a blueprint, if you will, about how to operate your cloud at scale in the DevOps way. Are you ready to transform your cloud knowledge into cloud power? Stay tuned, we're just gonna switch over. We're gonna go through each of these items in depth for October. So here we are, October 2023, number one. Amazon Bedrock, which is the new service AWS has offered to allow you to run all of the new generative AI models, is now generally available. It was announced about six months ago. It's now six months later. It is now GA. That means it's generally available in most of the major regions inside of both the United States, Europe, and Asia. So now you can actually practice running Llama. You can practice running the various models that are available. Take a look at this. It's pretty, it's pretty robust. Number two. AWS is going to require MFA on privileged users by basically enforcing MFA on people like the root user or administrative users by default in 2024. So it's basically going to enforce that level of security, which was always the best practice, but kind of like encryption with S3 buckets, AWS is now going to require it. Number three, AWS is first and foremost a security company. We have argued that, we've talked about it, we've had conversations about it. It is the number one thing. They're arguably the best at it, arguably, right? Now, you might understand, be curious though, how does this massive security team, which is thousands of engineers for AWS, how do they protect customers from distributed denial of service events? How do they do that? Because they're doing it all the time and we never see it. You may be familiar with Shield, which is enabled by default on all AWS accounts. Shield Advance is something you can pay for. How does AWS do that? That's number three. Number four, AWS Systems Manager, which basically has about 17 subservices underneath it. Things like Patch Manager, Distributor, Automation, Ops Center, like all that, that can be enabled by default, meaning that the agent that runs on EC2 in particular can be made to be run by default as part of you launching an EC2 instance, so it can be enforced at the systems level. It does require organizations, if I remember correctly, but take a look. I think this is a great step, especially if you don't already have agents baked into your AMI to handle this problem. That's number four. Number five, 
This is a hands-on, number five is a hands-on deep dive into doing blue-green deployments with CDK pipelines and code deploy. Totally worth checking out if you're not familiar with the CDK, totally worth checking out if you're not used to code deploy. Absolutely worth checking out if you don't understand the concept of blue-green deployments. This is a standard deployment pattern that you definitely want to be familiar with as you progress in your DevOps and your engineer or SRE career. So if you aren't familiar with it, this is a great deep dive to get hands-on to really understand it. Number six, this is also another hands-on tutorial. This is about how to scale to zero with your Kubernetes cluster and Carpenter, which is an autoscaler that AWS basically wrote and published that allows you to scale your EKS clusters down to zero. Zero, meaning zero worker nodes, meaning zero not paying for those systems, right? If it's scaled down to zero. now. Can most of us from a business perspective support an application that scales down to zero? No, but knowing how to do that for those development and staging and QA environments is probably gold. So knowing at least how you can do this gives you options, right? This is also another key architectural pattern is the ability to scale up and scale down as needed. That's number six. Number seven is actually the seventh in a journey to cloud native architecture series we were figuring out how to squeeze this in, but when they got to number seven, they started talking about containers. So they talked about how to containerize applications. This is the seventh in a series of posts that talks about how to go cloud native, how to make a cloud native migration and transformation. So not only is this just worth checking out because it talks about containers, it's worth checking out the first one, the second one, so on and so forth, up to the seventh, because it talks about how to convert your on-premise non-cloud native concepts into a cloud native infrastructure. And when I say that, I'm not just talking about cloud in terms of AWS, I'm talking about cloud native in terms of CNCF, Kubernetes, containerization, GitOps, platform engineering, those kind of things. So again, do you need to do all of it? No, you have to make it work for your use case. But seven is gonna give you a bunch of information about architectural patterns that can help make your application and your journey to the cloud more cloud native, not just cloud friendly. Number eight, last but not least, and this is significant. So sometime a couple of years ago, AWS came out with the Arch well, architecture framework and they kept adding things to it. So at first it was security and then it was reliability and then it was performance efficiency and then it was cost optimization. And then what happened is they added operational excellence because they realized that infrastructure is code and those DevOps practices were a huge part of it. Then they added sustainability, which again, makes total sense because wanting to become Earth's greenest employer and greatest employer and wanting to sustain the Earth, that makes sense. Implementation is a little difficult. Now what they've done is that for that operational excellence piece, they've come up with a couple of DevOps stories or sagas about how to implement DevOps practices into your well-architected framework kind of as both an insertion into the operational excellence pillar, but also almost like it's a hidden like seventh pillar for DevOps. So totally recommend you check that out, particularly if you are in the DevOps space and you identify as someone who works and does and upkeeps and advocates DevOps. Number eight is gonna be your friend, particularly in relationship to AWS. As always, we'll share this PDF with you. We've got the sources for week one, week two, week three, week four, and week five down below so you can see exactly where we drew these from. But hopefully you enjoy this week. My name is Michael Forrester. Please leave some comments. Let us know if you want more different content. We are, we're always innovating and love to hear from our students. And I'll catch you next month at Keeping Up With AWS in November.